40 and let us look at the future or rather let us look at all that you have not learned so far. So, as I said the field of programming languages we have broadly divided into three syntax, semantics and pragmatics. So, let us look at each of them. The story of syntax which actually started with Chomsky finally ends with having found the murderer. So, the, you can get linear time deterministic parsing algorithms for any language which consists of regular or context free and or context free productions. And boiling down to basics what that means is that as long as you do not have anything more complex than parenthesis matching you are safe with and you can get linear deterministic <coughs> linear time deterministic algorithms that is that is really what it all boils down to. Um, <coughs> despite all the complex normal forms that might be that might have been invented and so far uh, so, uh, and so far it does not really matter. Um, and what is so you have looked at parsing algorithms for example, the PL0 compiler and so on and so forth. And the next extension which is of course, already available in most Unix systems is that of a parser generator. And that just uses the fact that any note firstly given any notation my first uh, my first aim would be to see if I can just convert it into grammatical rules. And the extended BNF notation is one that is directly generated by a context free grammar. So, where you can you can actually so you can so the lex and yak programs which are available on any Unix system they essentially are parsers for the extended BNF notation. So, take any grammar <coughs> So, take any grammar given as production rules using braces and um, square brackets and so on and so forth. It is possible to generate a parser automatically from the grammar rules. Of course, the extended BNF notation is just one possibility. The other possibility is to use Pascal like syntax diagrams. It is possible to use a one I mean there is a one to one correspondence between the extended BNF notation and Pascal like syntax diagrams. And what it means therefore, for to construct uh, what it means to construct a parser generator therefore, is to write a parser for the extended BNF notation itself regarded as a language which generates syntax diagrams as graphs. Okay and that is automatically possible. And so, that is really what Lex and Yak do, mainly what Yak does. The specification of Lex for lexical analysis or token generation if you like can also be done automatically and that requires no more power than that of a context free grammar. So, you can use the same notation for both token generation and for uh, parser generation. Right. So, what it means is that you just give as inputs the production rules in an extended BNF notation and the parser generator like uh, the lex will produce tokens for the individual uh, for the individual syntactic categories elements and yak will take that and produce a syntax tree uh, a syntax tree generator. Yeah. So, then you just have to introduce code generation and so on and so forth. There are methods of doing automatic code generation which are not very perfect, but these two are fine and are actually used. So, the story of syntax is more or less finished. It is well understood that for context sensitive grammars or higher or grammars of uh, which are which are more uh, which are more powerful in a certain sense, which are more powerful not in the sense that they can generate a large number of sentences, but in the sense that they can generate a restricted class of sentences. After all, grammars are a means of control which allow you fine levels of restriction. <coughs> so, for anything like a context sensitive grammar or a type 0 grammar, what it is more or less uh, understood within the community 
that probably you will not get such good algorithms as you have for context free grammars. There was an attempt in Algol 68 to define what are known as fan Weingarten grammars, but it, it does not it did not proceed very far. Okay, so, the next thing is semantics. So, what we have looked at in terms of semantics is rather than give algorithms, after all for every algorithm that you give I can give a thousand variations of the same algorithm. Rather than give algorithms, give sim a simple collection of rules which are somehow syntactically motivated which provide the minimal framework on which an algorithm should be based, right. So, you can use this for both static and dynamic semantics. And if the, if your semantics, if your static semantics is structurally inductive, then what it also means is that all context sensitive grammatical and syntactic information of which types is one can also be specified by as static semantics. There have been methods for specifying semantics in a more uh, within the domain of a context free grammar itself and an important contribution in that respect is due to Don Knuth called attribute grammars, where he took context free grammars as a basis, as a framework and with each production you associate a semantical rule very much like something we do, but he encoded it in the form of code generation rules for to generate codes. And the idea was that now that you have parser generators, you should aut automatically also do code generation by using those attributes. So, a lot of what Knuth's, uh, uh, Knuth's work on attribute grammars is actually used in his software for text formatting called tech, which is really like a massive compiler, which generates code for a, in a device independent fashion. And he has used a whole lot of including his own parsing algorithms, most of the table driven parsers, the best known parsing algorithm with one step look ahead is due to Knuth uh, for context free grammars. Uh, it is a bottom up parser, he has used all this. Uh, so, an excellent application of programming languages, compiler concepts in something that is really not got anything to do with programming languages and compilers are text formatting programs. So, tech is one example, scribe is another, the EQN on the Unix systems is a third. They are all methods of codi coding notation into context free grammars parsing them and then generating code which is the formatted output, I mean which will give you the formatted output. <coughs> so, this, so, there is a higher level form of using these languages and grammars and semantical rules attributes which you can use for applications outside just the domain of programming languages. So, these are not, these are not, these are very general uh, methods, transition systems are very general, you can use it to describe anything. The notion of grammars and syntactic, syntax directed translation or syntax directed tra semantics is also a very general notion, which is going to be important whenever you are trying to automate any piece of software. So, whether it be automating symbolic computations in mathematics, automating proofs or uh, doing just plain text formatting or doing hypertext trans, uh, translations or uh, trying to map graphics images onto something. Uh, one good mechanism which people have followed with fruitful results is to somehow transform the whole problem into a grammatical problem and then into a semantical problem and use the principles of compilers constructions to actually solve the problem in some satisfactory fashion. Of course, what in order to fine tune it you might have to introduce heuristics and so on and so forth, but what it means is that whatever we have done is not very very restrictive. I mean it is it is something that has a wider applicability and has been used by several people actually to 
do, for example, image processing, text formatting. In fact, the design of all user interfaces for all kinds of software means first encoding the interface into a language, writing a translator or an interpreter for the language and interpreting it and executing it. Right. So, it, the, so in terms of applications, it goes quite far and uh, restricting ourselves to semantics itself, what we have what we have specified is what might be called operational semantics. Essentially, the fact that we did not have to describe algorithms, we just gave the minimal amount of information in terms of rules and then you can construct your algorithms based on that, makes it an operational semantics because it gives execution time behavior in a step by step fashion. We had one step transitions, we had many step transitions, right. So, it is really operational. The fundamental the f what makes it operational is that you are actually considering a step by step transformation of some notion of a configuration. So, you are looking upon the program as a transducer, you are looking upon each construct of the program as a little transducer and a program itself as a complex transducer made up of little transducers which provides transformations on the input. Right? So, it is operational in that sense. The other story is that you might, you can regard semantics as being denotational. That means, you can look upon every program itself as a function from some domain to another, purely as a mathematical function, which means you are not looking at its step by step transitions, but you are looking at just one feature. What is the input? to the output relationship of this program, bypassing all the intermediate information that might be available, right. So, what we is and here again it will, it will have to, we would like to do it in a syntax directed fashion. So, what we want to look upon is each language construct as denoting a function and a complex language and a, and a program therefore, which consists of language constructs somehow somehow connected together, we would look upon them, we would like to look upon them as functions which somehow are connected together to give you one large function, right. And so, we would like to express the meaning of a program as a function in terms of the functional meanings of its components. So, again in a structurally inductive fashion. In particular, what this means is that we have to be able to account for the semantics of loops and recursion in a perfectly syntax directed fashion, purely as functions, essentially as functions which compute a fixed point, functions which yield a fixed point, right. So, this is a, a, this is a functional um, semantics or a mathematical semantics or a denotational. Uh, denotational comes from the fact that you are talking of a language construct as being a syntactic object which actually denotes some abstract object just like a numeral denotes a number. In the same way, you want a language construct as just a syntactic representation of an abstract function in our mind, right. Uh, the other pos the other thing which is of some importance is 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 what is known as axiomatic semantics and there are several flavors of axiomatic semantics but principally what you are looking at in axiomatic semantics is that you want logical rules of influence for reasoning about programs in a language so, you are here again you want syntax directed logical rules of inference. The various flavors of axiomatic semantics are that these logical rules of inference. Uh, so, uh, when you are talking about reasoning about, a, about programs, then you are talking about reasoning about the behavior of programs and you require a language in which to express the reasons, express your reasoning about the program. One possibility of course, is first order logic and in fact, a large part of Pascal was actually axiomatized <coughs> by Hohenwirth 
in, the, in 1970, 1975 or so, and uh, and it and this th th their their logical rules also influence back the design of the language in order to make it clean. Uh, in fact, the problematic constructs in the language are those that they did not axiomatize, like variant records, types. It is clear that at that time they did not have much of a clue as to how to take care of those and those indeed are the problematic constructs. Right. Uh, the other possibility is to use what is known as equational logic but uh, we will not worry too much about it, but we will, but it is important for something later. And the fundamental thing here is that the fundamental tool here is the use of invariant properties to develop, prove, verify correctness against a specification, where the specification is also in the logical language which you are going to use to reason about programs. So, whether it is recursion or loops or anything, uh, what you want to develop are rules of inference for reasoning about the correctness. We are not, at this point we are not interested necessarily in specific functions. We are interested maybe in broad properties that the program should satisfy. So, we express the broad properties as predicates in some language. It turns out that first order logic is not a sufficiently powerful mechanism. For example, you will have to have first order logic augmented with mathematical induction in order to do reasoning. But the moment you introduce induction then you automatically become, you, you automatically get into the domain of a higher order logic because mathematical induction is not a first order logic specifiable predicate. So, there are problems about expressivity of the properties that you are interested in. Many of the properties that you are interested in may not be first order and they might require higher order predicates. There is an extra complexity by introducing another language even though it is a logical language. The other possibility is to actually do an axiomatic semantics within a single language framework, have a specification language which is a superset of your implementation language, have the notion of semantic equivalence as defined from an operational or a denotational viewpoint and do the reasoning as equations within the same language. That is another possibility that has been explored, right. And so, but this the use of invariant properties for reasoning essentially about imperative programs. That means reasoning about control which can change state is perhaps the most important reason why you would use an axiomatic semantics method. Right. And of course, the moment you have two or three different kinds of semantics, there is of course another problem of mismatch of the individual semantics. So, then you, you have the extra added obligation that you have to prove that the three semantics are all mutually consistent. Right. And you have the extra constraint that in the presence of all kinds of strange properties that you might have in your operational semantics, the, uh, the other semantics actually give you all the properties you are looking for, otherwise you may never be able to prove a program is correct. There might be certain properties which, which are in, so intrinsically operational. So, it is not just consistency that you, require, uh, that you require between the various semantical formalisms, you also require a completeness that every property that is expressible in operational semantics can be captured in the denotational framework or in the operational framework if I am to be able to prove all the properties correct. If I have to prove about all properties of the program that I am interested in, then they have to be somehow expressible, they have to be mutually expressible and that is what is known as a fully abstract, uh, it is a full abstraction problem. Uh, so, you have to prove not only that the semantics are consistent, but there is not so much information hiding in the operational semantics that you are not even able to prove certain properties in your axiomatic or your denotational framework, right. So, 
so, so there is a vast body of knowledge on semantics and then when you look at uh, pragmatics, what we have essentially looked uh, what we have essentially seen is that you have well various dynamic and stati uh, static storage allocation mechanisms, you have dynamic and static scope and binding mechanisms which we know how to deal with. Well, you have essentially heap stack heap and stack management, management of the runtime environment which essentially consists of the heaps, the stack and the code segment maybe also data attached to the code segment right. Then we also know about symbol table management at translation time and <coughs> it so happens that this is in fact all you require as a basis for implementation. It is a matter of deciding now for any few at least for the language constructs well, for the language constructs that we have not studied here so far and for the language constructs that have evolved over the last 20 years, it seems largely a matter of decision making for a given data item <coughs> given the properties of the language whether you should store the data item in the stack, in the heap or with the code segment given the nature of any construct how how much how much information is available at compile time therefore what other information is lacking which should therefore be checked at run time how many what, what things can be checked at compile time and therefore don't need to be checked at run time these are the basic implementation issues which we have looked at and which actually govern the extra uh, whatever new language constructs might that, that will probably come up, right. So essentially you have to look at the nature of the language whether it is statically, whether it is a static language or a dynamic language, you have to look at whether there is recursion in it in some form or in more than one form. Uh, for example, the while loop is a form of recursion, but implementationally it does not matter. The while loop can be regarded as being different from recursion because it does not mean creating new activation records, but semantically the while loop can be regarded as being another form of recursion. In fact, it is a tail, it is a form of tail recursion, right. So, by recursion in a at a in a pragmatic sense we actually mean recursion syntactically determinable recursion and uh, the and essentially from a given construct and from from the given nature uh, from the given language what is the kind of information that you can obtain at compile time or translation time based on that you can also you should you can also decide is it more suitable to have an interpreter for the language than a compiler. But the point is these, these days for any language you will have to have both an interpreter and a compiler. Essentially when you, when you go into a debugging mode of a compiled language like Pascal, you are essentially interpreting the language. But you are interpreting the language after the, after the, after all the information that is translation time extract uh, all the information that can be extracted at translation time has actually been extracted. If you take, if you decide, uh, if you ta take a language like ML or Lisp which is usually interpreted, eventually if you are going to productionize it, you cannot afford to run it in an interpreter mode. If there is some large piece of software which has to be run repeatedly, it cannot be run interpreted because what it means is this manual intervention and ma there is manual intervention where it is not necessary. So what you would like to do is compile the language, compile the program after having developed it. So you use the interpretive mode for developing the program correctly and testing it out 
and after that you compile it into an executable or an object code and run that object code. So essentially a part of a programming environment for any language is that there is that fine mix at development time you want an interpretive mode to be readily available. At production time you just want a, the object code, you want a compiled version of the program to be executed, right. So, uh, so that is, so based on the nature of the language what it therefore means is that what, what parts of the language can be readily interpreted, what parts of the language, so essentially what parts of the language give you information at compile time, what do they withhold from you at compile time and therefore what has to be obtained at run time, right. Should the symbol table for example be present at run time, I mean that is it is an important question, a Pascal symbol table is not, never present at runtime. But in a language, in a very, in a dynamic language like Lisp, you will probably have to maintain that symbol table at runtime, right. So if, if it is, if it is, if it is going to be a language which does not allow for a static type checking mechanism, it requires only dynamic type checking, then you will have to maintain all that information at runtime, right. So, and then as far as the nature of data is concerned, essentially your, in, your, your, the basic design decisions are going to be, is it static, statically determinable data? Can I determine types, l sizes, bounds at compile time? Is it dynamically created data or is it data that is persistent? And depending on that depending on these classifications, I essentially decide whether to store it in the stack, the heap or with the code segment, right. So, and in fact the pragmatic possibilities are not so high except when you move from our essential von Neumann architecture to a different architecture. The other possible architectures that you might want to move into are that of parallel architectures where you have a little von Neumann machine with its own local memory and connected through networks of connections, right. Or a completely non von Neumann, non von Neumann architecture, maybe a data flow architecture, in which case you actually create new pieces of automation dynamically maybe, okay. I mean th but those are the, those are the other possibilities. But essentially within the framework of a, s of a single or multiple CPU sharing some memory, essentially these are the only things that you can do. It is a matter of deciding between these possibilities, right. Lastly, we have to look at language features. And that is where most of the development has been in the last 20 years, in the last 15 years maybe. So if you look at language features, uh, there are two important features. So if you look at language features, well we have looked at basic language constructs, uh, basic data and data structures, basic notions of control in imperative and functional languages and we have looked at essential abstractions in the expression and command language and we have looked at scope issues, right. In fact, scope is a sort of overriding undercurrent throughout the discussion ever since definitions and declarations came in. Ever since the issue of naming comes, scope becomes an important issue. And scope is actually a very, uh, if you look at scope, it is actually fairly crude in the sense that it either provides you visibility, direct visibility and complete freedom to deal with a name or it completely hides the name and allows you no access to the name. And a name of course represents some object, either a data object or a control object, right. So one thing that you want to do is in from when you look at it from several viewpoints, 
just like you have control abstraction, the other possibility is to have data abstraction, which means you look upon gr you group together declarations regarded as a single unit as an abstract of definitions right and there are there are good reasons to uh, to deal with this one thing is that actually this is a contribution which originates with the language simula 67 which is a descendant of algol 60 but simula distinguishes itself in two important for two important features one is that it's the originator of the class concept okay and a standard byline in any deck 10 implementation which had simula 67 was a poster which said simula has class i mean this was there in the 70s the whole idea is that you actually you group together structured data and all the operations that can that are defined on that structured data in one single logical unit okay and that was a similar class except that it did not provide too much difference in visibility they use the standard scope rules but now when you encapsulate it with a name you get the module facility of modular and you get the classes of C++ or Smalltalk, which actually, uh, which which actually elaborated on that similar concept on the, on the class concept of similar, and provided the necessary abstraction. In pragmatically, what all that they did in Smalltalk was that they provided the necessary abstraction by allowing you not a direct access but an indirect access through pointers with with permission encoded in the access through pointers. So, pragmatically it was not a very great leap. What it meant was that everything uh, the, the whole but the, the philosophy was important in the sense that you have when we talk about an integer we are not talking only about the piece of data which is an integer. We are also talking about all the allowable operations on integers. For example, you cannot XOR two integers. Well, in C you can, but what I mean is you cannot logically XOR two integers. And so, along with integers comes the operations that are associated with integers: addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, excluding division by zero, and so on and so forth. So, when you there is absolutely no reason why we cannot lift the basic notion of a data type from basic scalar data types to higher data types to structured data to data structures. And when you bring in the abstraction what it means is that you regard a data structure primarily as an instance of an abstract data type. So, a, an abstract data type is just a collection of is just some structured data with, uh, with the operations associated with that structured data grouped together as a single unit right. And pragmatically what, what, uh, what this if you look at the classes of C++ uh, all that they do is that uh, the 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 struct construct of C or the uh, record structure of Pascal has just been elevated to deal with classes. So, since there is a fundamental unity between data and control, there is absolutely no reason why I cannot generalize a record structure in Pascal, where a field of the record is a function. Okay, and the record field specification gives me exactly the kind of visibility that I am looking for. The moment I specify the record name, I get access into the fields of the record. So, similarly the moment I specify the data abs the abstract data type name, I get access to the functions inside that abstract data type, but before that I do not have any access to it. Okay. 
So now for any abstract data type which you can regard at least pragmatically you can regard it as a generalization of Pascal records where there is a unity between data and functions. So a record field could be a function right. When you look upon it that way then if you insist that every data, data type also has among the operations that are associated with that data type are also creation and destruction operations. Then what it brings about is a fine interface by which there is no way of creating that data, uh, creating an instance of that data type unless you use the creation function inside that abstract data type. There is no way of destroying an instance of that data unless you use the destroying function inside that abstract data type. There is no way of manipulating several instances of the same data, uh, data type unless you use the functions inside that abstract data type which allow you manipulation. Okay. So now what happens is that the interface that I have is the name of the abstract data type and what it also means is that I cannot do indisciplined or indiscriminate changing of structure or manipulation of data without the permission of that abstract data type. Once I have done that, what it also means is that I can clearly separate out the specification or the interface of that abstract data, of that abstract data type. What is the inter interface of a procedure? The name and the parameters. What is the interface of an abstract data type? The set of fields inside it, which means the names of the data that can be created, the names of the functions that you can use, right. So I can separate out that interface from the implementation, which means now I can change the implementation. Since all operations on in, uh, uh, the creation, destruction and manipulation of all objects created by a data type are, are all resident within it. I can separate out the interface from the body of the abstract and I can change representations and therefore algorithms in the body of the abstract without affecting the interface. That is really what C++ classes are about. I cannot go into an instance of a class without essentially taking permission of the class. The representation of an object in that class is not directly available to me. The only way I can get to the representation of that class is by, the only way I can manipulate that instance of a class is by using the operations defined inside that class. So you can use different representations, you can change implementations. A new fancy algorithm with a new fancy representation has come for some complex data structuring mechanism, B trees or grid files, whatever. What it means is that I throw out my old implementation and write a completely new implementation with new representations, new functions, new algorithms for defining the operations on it, but I keep the interface intact. Right? So that all programs which use that old data type will still run with the new representation. As long as the interface does not change, there is absolutely no reason why old programs should not run. Right? So and that form of abstraction is what is, is what comes into, so these are all largely methodological issues. So new features are all guided by new methodologies. So the modules of modular 2, the classes and objects of small talk and C++, the signatures of ML. If you look at the signature structure in an ML and the implementation structure, you have two separate units which are mutual, which says so that the signature forms the interface to the, to any ML program which uses that data type 
which creates objects in their data type and manipulates them and even destroys them. And there is a separate implementation unit which is, which is hidden, which is not available. So, what it means is that I can separately compile programs with an abstract data type, which means I do not have the either the representation information or the algorithms available to me for that abstract data type, but I can still use that abstract data type in my program and compile my program. I can compile the specification, the signature file separately, I can compile the implementation separately provided the compiled version of the signature is available for the implementation in order to do type checking, in order to check out that the same operations are available. I can have lots of hidden operations which are not accessible from outside just like an, I can have local variables in a procedure which are not accessible from outside. Only the operations that are in the interface specified in the signature or in this module specification are actually available for manipulation and they use the representational information, right. So, that was an, so, so pragmatically speaking it is no big deal, but when you look at it from the point of view of developing large libraries in a representation independent fashion and providing a certain fine control of visibility and information hiding, then it is actually an important step forward, right. Right. So, this directly generalizes to libraries and then the, therefore, the field of data structures goes out of the window and what you have is the field of data abstraction, right. The last and probably the most one of the most vigorous areas of research currently is, is concurrency. It starts with just here again the first possible Represent, language representation of parallelism probably came through the coroutine concept in Simula, where they actually wanted to simulate the fact that there is a CPU with several, pro, uh, several in, a, in, a, in, a, in a time sharing system um, uh, with multiprocessing <laughs> capability where a job is executed for some time thrown into suspension and another job is executed for some time and so on and so forth. They wanted to use it as a simulation facility to study let us say operating system concepts. They also brought down the operating system concept through the coroutine method into a language, into the language to study this method and that gave a new essentially uh, a new uh, method of control which is different from procedural abstraction in the sense that now, a, a procedure from a main program is an asymmetric relationship. You call the procedure and return at the end of the procedure to the main program. Two coroutines have a symmetric relationship. You execute part of one coroutine with a resume command, you move into the other coroutine starting from where you left off or if it was a first call, then you start from the beginning till you resume back. So, you, you pass control mutually between different coroutines and that essentially simulates the behavior of jobs on a single processor system with time sharing, okay. Now, you can generalize it of course, to multiprocessor systems with time sharing, memory sharing, whatever. You can generalize it further to distributed systems with shared memory distributed systems with local memory and no sharing or mixtures of these and what you get as a general logical notion is an, is concurrent systems. And when you boil all this down to its basics, when you look at a concurrent system, it could be multiprocessing, it could be time sharing, it could be distributed, it could be memory sharing, it could be not memory sharing, whatever. When you look at the fundamental problems of concurrency, then essentially it reduces to three important things. Independence, causality and conflict and how do these three concepts interact with each other. So, what you can model the nature of 
distributed computations or time shared computations or mixtures of these by creating a new language construct which looks at these three problems and their mutual interactions. Right? And what it gives you therefore is once you have decided on independence, causality and conflict is that independence and conflict together actually give you another form of non-determinism. You can import non-determinism also that is in fact it is from concurrency from the elementary studies of concurrency. The coroutine concept in Simula was a purely deterministic construct. But when you analyze the large scale behavior of an operating system with respect to various jobs without knowing anything about the scheduler, then you are forced to introduce into your simulation language a method of non-determinism which is not just probability based. You want to be able to claim that those jobs execute correctly or fairly in spite of whatever may be the scheduling mechanism. You would like prove your programs correct regardless of whether lightning or thunder strikes them. And then what you have is that as an undercurrent you have non-determinism. In fact, that is how non-determinism came as a construct into programming languages, the study of operating systems. In bringing down operating system structures to languages or providing language support to operating system design for multiprocessor or time sharing operating systems. right? And then what you can do is once you have concurrency as a very general notion regardless of the underlying architecture, you can actually exploit fine grained parallelism by making clear, making clear what exactly are dependent events and what exactly are independent events, what exactly are conflicting events which is a form of non-determinism. Right? And you can actually look at localized computations. You can look upon the notion of a process or you can look upon parallelism in the abstract as a pure programming language construct completely devoid of its reality. When you want to get back to reality of course, what you do is you map the parallelism into a multiprocessor architecture by looking at dependence, causality and conflict relationships. Right? So, it is a very important and vigorous means of study, uh, vigorous subject of study and what happens in this is that you can boil it down even further to its basics and regard communication and parallelism as the main primitives for computation control and express all possible computations in terms of communication and parallelism. Right? So, and of course, let us not forget one important thing, there is a fundamental unity between data and control, which means that control, which means that under such a model, firstly I can express all data as through processes, I can express all processes also as data if I wanted to do it. But essentially I can express all data and control as processes some which somehow communicate and interact. I can even look upon the assignment statement as a form of communication between, between a process which is one memory cell, another process which is that expression and the act of reading and writing are communications between two very small processes. Right? And once you have this fundamental unity of course, uh, you should not forget the lambda calculus. Right? If you look at communication then it is just a form of beta reduction. The act of reading or writing, the act of assignment is a form of beta reduction. So, control abstraction is a lambda abstraction, data abstraction is a lambda abstraction, communication is a beta reduction, parallelism is a is an lambda application, parameterization is a lambda abstraction, parameter passing or ins, uh, or instantiation is a form of beta reduction. 
and finally everything boils down to that. Can you actually look at all these kinds of behaviors as forms of beta reduction? What are the abstraction mechanisms that you can impose on top of con concurrency? What are the type checking mechanisms you can put in? How can you do, how can you do higher types over communications? Can you define higher order processes just like you did higher order functions? What does lambda abstraction over higher order processes mean? What does parameterization do? How do you map process to processor? How do you map the real life situation which is a geographic distribution of some sites to an existing abstraction? And the importance of that abstraction is that if you were to change the architecture of your distributed system, your abstraction still stands and you can do a fresh mapping of process to processor without changing your original algorithm. It is a new methodology method of programming which looks at fine grained parallelism, fine grained independence, looking at essential conflict relations, essential causal relations and based on that you do your process to processor mapping yeah? and that is what the future holds in the light of the lambda calculus. So the most important thing to do is to study Zen and the art of the lambda calculus.